Good morning. This summer we're doing a series, The Word Inspires, and um, I've, you know, the way that we're doing it is ready for clergy to say something about some of their favorite books of the Bible, and we made sure that we're not going to repeat ourselves, right? We couldn't all choose John's Gospel or something. Um, So you might have got to know John really well by the end of the summer, so maybe that's what we should have done. Anyhow, I have the, the joy and the pleasure of talking about Mark's gospel today. And um, Mark is is a short gospel. Uh, I think it packs a punch. I think it's kind of the cliff notes in some ways of a lot of, uh, you know, of Jesus's story. Uh, A lot of times it's the gospel that when somebody becomes a Christian, uh, they, you know, they're kind of, what what do I read? Where do I start? Right, the common one thing to say is, go read Mark's gospel. It's short, tells you about Jesus, Good way to, good place to get going. Um, and it's also kind of the source material of the Gospels. So most scholars and academics would agree that Matthew and Luke have used uh, Mark. Got confused with my right, authors here. Uh, you have used Mark to put together their Gospels. So it's, it's kind of the, agreed to be the earliest, or probably thinking like the 60s um, AD. And, and for me, it's an interesting one. So my, people will often get confused when, um, with my PhD because they're like, is it Old Testament? Is it New Testament? Is it Revelation? Is it something, Second Temple Jewish? And that gets a little specific. Um, it's a little confusing because I do actually start in Mark's Gospel, but then I end up in lots of other random apocalyptic texts that nobody's heard about, cared to read, or interested in. So when people say, hey, I want to read your PhD, I'm like, you actually don't. So you think you do, and I'll take it as a compliment, but if you opened it up, you'd go, what, what? So, but I can do double around in Mark and inter- like interpretive arguments about Mark. Um, so it's the earliest account that we have of Jesus's life and his death and his crucifixion. So Paul's letters come before it, Right, they were the 40s and 50s, but Mark is the first written account of Jesus' life. It's the first gospel, as we understand it. And Mark, and so, okay, so that's kind of a little setup for you. We're going to pause and pray, and then I'm going to kind of try and pitch to you why Mark is so inspiring and why you all should take your Sunday afternoons to read it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your written word how it points us to you, Jesus, our living word. Help us, we pray, as we open it and think about it this morning. And by your Holy Spirit, you might inspire us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Mark, is, it's a short gospel, and, um, and it begins quite boldly, right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't pull any punches, it doesn't hold back it launches right in. If you compare it to the other Gospels, Matthew starts with, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, David, the son of Abraham. Right, so the historians in the room, their eyes light up, like, oh, this is interesting, right? And those who understand Jewish history, but if you're not in those two categories, you might kind of go, it's a genealogy. Do I really want to listen any further? Okay, Luke begins with the manner of someone who's writing a history they want to preserve, right? So Luke opens, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. So here you get the sense of somebody trying to kind of give an orderly, understood, thought, thoughtful account of Jesus's life. And they've looked at various sources and heard lots of stories and, and are piecing it together. And John, he's, I, I think, second to Mark, John probably is the most intriguing in terms of its opening, but it's a little more philosophical, right? It's not packing a punch. It's a bit more philosophical. It's the famous, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Not so with Mark. Mark opens the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, you and I talk about good news and the gospel so much that we don't really hear that and see the punch that is 
being laid out before us, right? We don't see what Mark is doing. But the word gospel, the word good news is euangelion in Greek. And what it, it's a word that would describe a proclamation from the Roman Empire, right? So if something is coming in, like there's a news flash, there's a, uh, you know, you're watching TV and something suddenly jumps in and interrupts it from the White House. It's that kind of a word. We hear good news, and we're like, oh yeah, it's good news, it's nice, I like it. That's not what euangelion means. There's a powerful message that is being spoken. There is something that you're going to sit up and listen. What's going on? This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark doesn't hold back. It's not a son of Abraham, not the son of David. This is the Son of God. This is somebody appointed by God, from God, who is proclaiming this new message. Now, if your attention isn't held by this point by Mark's gospel, you ain't reading it right, okay? (laughs) This is something to sit up and listen to. Are you paying attention? Mark chapter one kind of unpacks that proclamation through to about verse 15. And we're not gonna go through the whole of Mark at this pace, at this rate, otherwise we'll be here all day and we have services to get to. But Mark 1 is is where you want to spend a little bit of time. But it it does, it kind of unpacks something of what this proclamation is. Your attention has been grasped, and Mark is like, okay, now I've got your attention. Here's what's what's happening. And right into verse 2 and 3, and here he quotes from the prophets. uh, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of crying, one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And these words taken from the Old Testament say, kind of invite us to think immediately to think about there's something to prepare for. God is coming, right? There is prepare the way of the Lord. God is coming. His kingdom is coming. His promises are being fulfilled. Something new is here. So prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And then quickly we get into the forerunner, who the forerunner of this arrival is going to be, and that is John the Baptist. And so we get him coming in in this sort of strange esoteric clothing and eating wild honey and locusts. And he starts baptizing people. And he starts saying, hey, it's time for y'all to repent. It's time for y'all to get ready. You get this flesh out. Whatever is coming, whatever this good news is, there's a little bit of busy work required, right? (laughs) There's a little bit of something that we need to get into and start doing. And then John points us to Jesus. And he says, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So not only is this one who is coming the son of God, but this one is coming with the power of God, the spirit of God. What he is doing is a work of God, not a work of humankind. And then immediately, it launches into who this person is. Verse nine, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And we get this sort of Trinitarian image of this voice, this heavenly voice, God the Father speaking from heaven, the spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove. And these words, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. So this anointed one, this one who is coming, We have this scene of empowerment for the ministry he's going to be leading by God's own spirit. That's the authority that this one is acting under. And then in conclusion of this kind of opening proclamation, we get Jesus' first sermon in Mark's gospel. uh, Chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The time is fulfilled. The moment is now. The kingdom of God has come near. And that's, you know, we talk about the kingdom of God a lot. It kind of in the church, right? It's there in scripture. It's something that we're aware of as a phrase. 
we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the kingship of God. Back to verse 1. There's a euangelion. There is a message. This is, it echoes something of that Roman emperor, political proclamation. But here it's not a political power. It is a spiritual power and the power of all powers. It's the power of God, the kingship of God. And it's here. So repent. Believe. Get ready. So there's one reason that you might find Mark a little inspiring, right? It opens and it draws us in and it says something new is here. How are you going to respond? Do you realize it's here? And what are you going to do about it? But when we come and we think about this sort of new thing, and in the same way that whenever we hear about a new person uh, coming, whether it's political, somebody we work with, uh, our daughter or granddaughter has just got engaged, you know, just met this new guy and it looks like they're going to get engaged. Like, well, who is this person, right? What's going on? Like, what are they like? And so with this arrival of this anointed one, this one who is going to fulfill God's promises, this leader, it's natural to think about, well, kind of who, how are they going to align themselves? What are they going to do? What's their, what are their values? What are they going to bring? And what I find so interesting and challenging and inspiring about Mark is it sets up a clear conflict right in the first few chapters of Mark between Jesus and with evil, right? Manifested. And we see these, we see evil in the form of Satan. We see it in unclean spirits, but also through the religious leaders and in Mark's gospel at times, even the disciples, right? Peter is the one who says, no, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to suffer. This isn't going to happen. What is Jesus's words to him? Get behind me, Satan. There's this conflict that unfolds in Mark's gospel and a question that kind of is presented to us about which side we're going to be on. So if you kind of, if you had time to take a walk through the first three chapters of Mark, you would see certain conflicts. So in Mark 1, in Mark 1, 24, we've got a a deliverance of somebody with an unclean spirit on the Sabbath, right? Jesus is in the synagogue. And the unclean spirit cries out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The people might not know at this point, but the unclean spirits know what's, what's arrived. They know who Jesus is. So he silences them and delivers this man. And then in chapter 2, 1 through 12, you've got the, the story of the man who's, the paralyzed man who's lowered in through the roof by his friends. And uh, Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven right? Pick up your mat and walk. And there's a sort of indignation. How can you do this? Only God has authority to forgive sins. This is blasphemy. And so here, so we've had tension with the, with the unclean spirits. Here we've got tension with the religious leaders, the scribes, who are not sure. They don't like this man. They don't like the, the authority that he has and the things that he's doing right from the start. In the second half of chapter two, the Pharisees accuse him of eating. You're eating with tax collectors and sinners. How can you do that? We see another conflict that is beginning to happen. And then there's another one. They accuse him of not keeping the law when it comes to fasting. Why are your disciples not fasting, but John's are? And what's going on? Another setup. And then they accuse him and his disciples of not keeping the Sabbath, right? You're like, you know, they're going through the fields and take a few ears of grain and they get into trouble for that. And so they, we see this kind of these conflict upon conflict. And some of them are with unclean spirits, but some of them are with the religious leaders. And then by the time we get to Mark chapter three, they're already seeing if they can catch him in the act. So chapter three, verse one, again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him 
on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. So that they might accuse him. This one who is the promised one of God, who is empowered by the Spirit, is already riling people so much that they are trying to catch him in some kind of point of their law so that they could levy an accusation against him. They're already looking out to see how they can bring him down. Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, come forward. And then he says to, to the people there, to the religious leaders, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? And in asking that question, he exposes their hearts because they wanted to get him for healing on the Sabbath. And he draws their attention back to the true meaning of the Torah as a Sabbath, as a time for healing, a time of rest, a time of restoration. If healing was going to happen any time, really, it should be on the Sabbath. And they're silenced because they know that he knows better. But Jesus looks around them and he looks around them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretches it out and he is restored. And then the Pharisees go out and they conspire with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. So within three short chapters, this good news, this new kingdom, this new authority that is being brought to bear by one who is empowered by the Spirit, who is God's Son, is rattling people. And there are people there who don't want to live under God's authority. They don't want to live in the king, their God's kingdom. They want to live in their kingdom. Or the kingdom of God as they have kind of created, which is really the kingdom of man. Then we have one more story of Jesus delivering someone with an unclean, or delivering people with unclean spirits. And he had the appointing of the 12. And the reason that I'm sticking with chapter 3 is because of what comes next. So verse 19 tells us, Then Jesus went home, and a crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For the people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. Jesus has gone home. And even his family, his friends, they're like, whatever this is, this ain't right. This ain't right. And then from that, and I'm going to read this. So they say, hang on a second, let's just, he has gone out of his mind. And then the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, and this is their explanation for Jesus' apparent craziness, being, being out of his mind. The scribes say, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons, he has cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house, plunder his property, without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. So in this scene, he's gone home, his family thinks he's out of his tree. The scribes rock in, they give an explanation that he's possessed, right? This is the work of Satan. And Jesus says, like, well, no, that does not make sense. And here's a few reasons why.
And what we learn here is, I don't know how, how to say, explain this. What we have here is a kind of a summing up of what has been brewing since the start. Jesus is the one, he's the son of God. He is the one who is being waited for to bring about God's kingdom. He's the one that John the Baptist said, he will baptize with the spirit. He's the one at his baptism, who's the spirit of God descended upon. He's the one who casts out unclean spirits. He's the one who heals. He's the one who teaches with authority. He is empowered by the spirit. But those who are so cross, are so upset, so mad with him, they have gotten so mad so quickly that they are willing and ready to say, this is the work of evil. This is the work of evil. And, and that's why this is, you know, this is the sort of the, the, the sin against which whoever blasphemes, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. Because what is going on is they've had these experiences. They are seeing God at work in their midst. And they are so hardening themselves to the work of God's spirit through the ministry of Jesus that they are saying that, that this is not just, eh, it's a bit weak, but I'm not interested, right? This isn't, this isn't great. I don't like it. I think the guy's wrong. They've gone so far. They've hardened their hearts so far the other way that this is the work of evil. This is something to be destroyed. And that kind of sounds, you know, at first, in in our first breath with that, we might kind of think, well, oh my goodness, how on earth? How on earth could anybody do that? Be so hardened to the good news, to what we have in Christ. I think this is a question that actually is much more real for us than we might like to admit. Because a lot of the times, God is speaking to us by his spirit. We're not comfortable with it. I'm not going to, I don't think that most of us are going so far as to say it's evil. I hope not, for your sakes. But sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes we don't listen and we don't listen and don't listen. And that not listening becomes hardness. And that hardness becomes resentment. And that resentment becomes bitterness or even harder resentment. And eventually we find ourselves in an accusatory place with the very words of God. But here, Jesus reveals his purpose. Rather, there's the religious leaders who are saying these terrible things about the work of God in their midst. Jesus gives us a clue as to what his real purpose is. He is here to bind up the strong man. This is not Satan against Satan. This is God coming to bind up the strong man so that he can plunder the house, so that he can just empty evil of its power. So that is the conflict in Mark. Are we on Jesus' side? Are we working for, well, working with him against evil? Or are we on the side of evil that can be manifest in different ways and looks at the work of God and says, that's not God. And this conflict kind of runs throughout Mark's gospel. It's a whole different way of thinking about it. Because in Bible studies, often what we do is we spend a lot of time in one story or one passage. So I'm hoping with this, you kind of, you might not remember chapter and verse, and I'm not expecting you to. There's no test. But having a bit of a kind of speedy walkthrough and kind of looking at the overview of it gives us a bit more of an understanding that when we do sit down with the story, we know there's a big picture. Mark might be short. It might be famous for saying, and immediately, at various points, right? He moves the the story along. It's like me speaking, right? He He doesn't hold back. He doesn't leave long pauses. He doesn't give time for people to think. And then this happened, and then that happened. So it's quite fitting that I should be teaching on Mark today. But that doesn't mean that Mark doesn't have 
a message that he's trying to convey and something that he's trying to explain to us and that he's inviting us to respond to. And I contend with that one verse one, the euangelion, the good, good news, but that Mark has a very important message that he wants us to hear. And this conflict is, it runs throughout the whole of the gospel. Uh, we have from Mark 3, we continue in healing miracles, casting out of demons, teaching people, challenging religious authorities, and Jesus again and again telling of his coming, suffering, death, and resurrection that his disciples don't get. And I think it's worth pausing at this point and saying one of the um, kind of, you know, when I used to teach high school and I would teach Mark's gospel, and uh, one of the kind of recurring themes that we would really try and get into the kids' heads is discipleship in Mark's gospel, right? Mark's gospel, the disciples don't look great. They make a lot of mistakes. They really don't understand Jesus. They aspire to greatness rather than service. They don't want Jesus to suffer. They run when he's arrested. They do not look great at all. And that is really helpful when we think about this kind of setup in Mark that I'm talking about, this conflict between good and evil. We're on the side of Jesus. We don't have to be great. To respond to God doesn't require us to have every all our ducks in a row. It's about our humble readiness to receive the word of God, to receive the kingship of God, to say, yes, I want what God has to offer and to work with God's spirit at preparing our lives accordingly. And we have this beautiful message of Jesus bearing with his disciples. I mean, there's a few kind of like face palm moments. Like, oh my gosh, you guys still not getting it. Still not getting it. So even in this kind of cosmic conflict that Mark kind of sets up, there is space to be human. And there is space for us to work with God at our own pace, where we find ourselves, with our questions. And he will work with us and he will walk with us. So from Mark chapter 1 to 3, we have this kind of setup of this big proclamation, this new thing that is coming. Are you ready? Jesus' first sermon. Right? The kingdom of God has come. The time is being fulfilled. Repent and believe the good news. Get ready. And then through chapters 1 to 3, we kind of get a sense of who Jesus is and what he's about. And we see quite quickly who his enemies are going to be. Who doesn't like, who the people who don't like this new message that is being conveyed and brought to bear. And then in chapter 3, we get this kind of unveiling of... Jesus' purposes, the kind of ultimate conflict that's going on within Mark. And within Mark's gospel, it's good to know that there are two kind of big chunks of teaching. Right? There's chapter 4 and chapter 13. So chapter 4 is a number of parables, including the parable of the sower. Right? The guy, you get, you know, sower goes out and he sows on the, uh, you know, the path and in the thorny soil where there are other like nettles and things and in the soil where there are rocks and the sun burns up the roots and then the good soil and so that's one of the parables there are other parables in there as well and it's all about this the kingdom of god what the kingdom of god is like uh, and most of the time i mean who has heard this I, for me when i have heard this um, this parable preached it's always about coming to faith anybody else it's always about like are you going to respond to jesus it's not usually, we don't often think about it in terms of God's word to us today, the work of the spirit of God today. Are we good, are, are we good soil? If Jesus, you know, showed up today and it was a euangelion again, right? This is the, the return of Christ. Would we, would we get it? Would we, like, would we be like Peter and say, yeah, I'll leave my nets and I'll follow you. I'll get it wrong along the way, but I'll, I recognize something good is here. But when Jesus returns, it's like, this is suspect because you're not how I expected you to be. And I'm so wrapped up in how I think you should be. I'm going to push hard against it. We read the parable of the sower is about the kingdom of God. 
It's about the arrival of God, the, the word of God that is being kind of being sown. And the question is, are we going to respond to it? And so as we think about those first three chapters and the conflict between Jesus and the scribes, primarily, but also the Pharisees and the Herodians and later the Sadducees, we see different responses. And we see some people who recognize there's something of God and they want him to, want Jesus to heal them. We have the disciples who respond and say, yeah, I want to follow you. So within Mark's gospel itself, we get these examples. Not of people coming to faith for the first time. These are, by and large, all Jewish folk. Right? They understand the law. They understand their heritage. They understand faith in God. But are they going to understand this new thing that God is doing and the fulfillment of all their pro- promises and hopes that God has given to them? Okay, um, I'm going to jump forward a little bit into chapter 9. Here we get another glimpse of Jesus' authority in Mark's gospel with the transfiguration. Right, so here this is a story of when Jesus goes up uh, the, the hillside with Peter, James, and John, and then Moses and Elijah show up. And so people talk about in Mark's gospel about the sort of messianic secret, that Jesus is kind of secretive about the truth of who he is. He doesn't want people to know. And I think I think that's because he understands there's a purpose that he's he's got. And there are things that need to go in the right order. And it's not always the right time for everybody to know everything. So the unclean spirits knew. The disciples kind of got a sense of it, even if they missed the mark here and there. God's spirit, kind of, John the Baptist knew, God's spirit at his baptism made it clear. And here at the Transfiguration is this revelation to Peter, James, and John. It's pretty amazing they still don't get it at this point. If you've gone up a hillside with this guy that you think is the Messiah, you've seen Moses and Elijah, and you've seen him kind of like transcend into this weird, I think of Doctor Who regenerating, you know, like the kind of... Light shining and emanating from him. And they still don't get it. But here Mark is telling us, this is who Jesus is. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Right? He's the fulfillment of Moses and Elijah. He is the one of God. And again, we have, this, we have a voice from heaven. Right? This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. It's God's son. And... I already don't have time to say this, so I'm going to say it now. In Mark's gospel, if I'm not mistaken, the first person to confess Jesus, like human person, to confess Jesus as God's son is the centurion at the cross. It's Mark 15, 39. When the, now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. Mark tells us from the start, right? The, the narrator tells us. We get it told to us by God himself at the baptism and the transfiguration. The unclean spirits know it. Centurion is the first one to get it. An outsider. So this conflict, I've got five minutes. <laughs> this conflict of this kind of Jesus, your Jesus is unfolding authority in Mark's gospel, but this conflict between Jesus and evil and the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, it really gets very intense in Mark 11 and 12. I'm going to leave you to read that by yourselves. But if you read through that, you do, you've got Jesus in the temple, turning over the tables. You have the parable of the vineyard, which is the story of a man leaving his vineyard with some tenants, right? But they're not giving him what he's due. So he sends servants and they work, they, you know, beat them up and he sends his son and they kill his son. And so he takes the vineyard from them and gives them to others. It's a pretty harsh judgment on the religious leaders of the day. Um, and we have a lot, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of conflict through that, uh, that little section. You have quotes from Jeremiah, you have made it God's house a den of robbers, what should be a house of prayer. We get an acknowledgement right at the end of, of uh, chapter 12. 
Right, there were many rich people who were coming in, putting large sums of money into the treasury. There's a poor widow comes in. She puts in two small copper coins. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had. And then in Mark 13, this is my PhD area, so I'm going to sum it up in three minutes. Fun. Um, is Jesus kind of some pretty harsh words of judgment. And my contention is that Mark 13 is all about the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. Because ultimately this cosmic conflict between Jesus and evil in Mark's gospel culminates in evil having the apparent victory because the religious leaders, hand they conspire to get Jesus arrested, handed over and crucified. So they have ultimately, they've gone, they've taken it as far as you can take it when it comes to rejecting God and blaspheming the work of the spirit. It's not just indifference, it's conspiring to destroy him and it's actually bringing about his destruction. And so they've evil, apparently victors, but we know that oh, God is a God of a deeper magic than C.S. Lewis puts it in the Chronicles of Narnia. And that actually through Jesus' sacrifice, through his surrender, evil discovers it's been emptied of all its power. But the result of this is some pretty harsh words of judgment upon the religious leaders and the eventual destruction of the temple, which kind of makes sense with the placement of Mark in the 60s. Right, This is just before the Jewish war and the destruction of the temple in 70. So there's a sense in which things are shaking and they can see what's coming. Mark 13 says, yes. Uh, in Mark 13, Jesus says, first of all, foremost in verse 2, not when the disciples are gawping at this temple and its amazing stones and its amazing size. And he says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. All will be thrown down. And then he lays out, whenever there's a prophecy, we all want to know when exactly it's going to happen. And he's like, chill out, right? Like there's going to be suffering. There's going to be hard times. Just don't panic. Don't panic. But then he does say, well, when you see this, when you see a desolating sacrilege and you see something in the temple that shouldn't be, that's when you run. Because that's when it's going to happen. And so Mark 13 kind of describes it both in kind of more everyday terms and in some kind of apocalyptic, weird sun, moon and stars terms. Uh, there, there, there is destruction coming upon the temple and upon the evil that has been working along with them for what's coming next in Mark, which is Jesus' death and resurrection. And my contention, and this is all I'm going to leave you with, and this is courtesy of Susan McBay, not any scholar. But maybe at some point, somebody will be convinced. Mark 3, when Jesus says, to plunder the property, you first have to bind up the strong man, and then you can plunder, and the house can be plundered. My contention is, that is pointing to the cross, the death and resurrection, which ties up the strong man, right? That defeats the power of evil. And the power of evil had been such that it had taken over the religious life of the temple. That in 70 CE, the house was plundered. And so that in that Mark 3 verse, you actually have a tying together both of Jesus' death and resurrection, which is the concluding chapters of Mark. And this prophecy about the destruction of the temple, which is here in Mark 13. I'm going to, I've got four minutes for questions. <laughs> I'm sorry I don't have any slides. That's just my lack of organization. Um, I know I've thrown a lot at you. Any questions? No. Can you see why it's good news? <laughs> Can you see why this is a proclamation that is worth our attention, worth sitting up for? Okay, okay. Am, I, am I ready? Am I listening? Will I hear Jesus' words to us today? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for Mark's gospel. 
And we thank you for the whole of your word. Help us not just to listen to it and hear it, but help it to sink into our hearts, into our prayers, into our lives. That we might respond in faith. See what you have done for us. See the type of kingdom that you have brought about. And know that same power of the, of the Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There you go.